Welcome to Solosaurus, a podcast about one player board in card games and giant thunder lizards. Solosaurus is sponsored by Stone Valley Games, your friendly, distant game store. Visit them at stonevalleygames.com. And now, here come your hosts stomping through the underbrush, Michael and Martin. I was going to mention, I saw um, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi, yeah. It's on, uh, I think it's on HBO. Um, yeah. I've got it. I haven't seen it yet. How, I watched, did you like it? Yeah, I did. I didn't expect to at all, you know, because I've just been kind of marveled out, I think. It was after 26 mm-hmm. movies, and I really enjoy them all, even Thor The Dark World, which I know is not the most popular movie among the group. But right. uh, I loved it. It was really good. I don't know that I'd watch it again just because I'm kind of burned out, like I said. And uh, I've heard bad things about the Eternals, so I don't know if I'm going to watch that, but I'll probably will. Yeah, I didn't hear bad things about that, too. I, I enjoyed <laughs> – so uh, Marvel, I mean, they've had so much practice and they have so much budget now that uh, I don't think they're capable of turning out a flat-out bad movie. And then, of course, the Eternals comes out. But And, then, and I haven't <laughs> seen it. I don't know either way. But I really enjoyed um, Black Widow, and yes. I'm looking forward to Shang-Chi. All of these like movies in the kind of post – um, end game Thanos story, a story arc, you know, um, Infinity Stones. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how they work out, like you know, because they were still figuring out the formula for over the last 10 years, but now they're like, Yeah, we've got the formula sh- uh, sharpened to a polished to a high sheen. So, right, I'm yeah, excited to see how they do. It does kind of allude to who the next big MacGuffin bad guy is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't. I'll, I don't. I will not spoil it for you. But I'm wondering if you'll catch it or not. I don't, um, how much of a Marvel right. fan you are? But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. So anyway, I'll check it out. I watched um, Loki on uh, Disney Plus, and that supposedly oh, yeah? alludes to the big bad for it... for the next few years. <laughs> I'll have to rewatch it because so. I'm used to binging things, and I and I watched that whole thing. But I watched it as each episode came out, more or less. And I never do that ever, ever, ever. Uh, but I've been addicted to Loki too, and uh, mm-hmm. I'll have to rewatch it again just to get that back into my head exactly what it was intending. But mm-hmm. anyway, yeah. Let me. Hey, did, didn't we have a podcast? That we something to like that. Yeah, I've already okay. been recording. I started recording <laughs> just <laughs> before I started talking about Shang Chi. So, <laughs> so did you look at the outline? Does it look okay? Yeah. To you? Yeah, All no, right. it looks great. Thank you. So, Thank you for making that. Yeah. Um, Intro the... sponsored. Sorry. Go ahead. What's that? As no, say, the main thing is, yeah, thank you for filling in the news items. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure. To uh, we're going to, yeah, well, let's, 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 the only thing we're changing is that we don't have a main one game that, that right. you and I both play that we're reviewing. But Right, yeah. I saw your list. I'm like, damn, hey, look at you. You got lots in. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, I've seen your posts on Facebook, like I said. So I was like, hey, yeah, he, he, I'm sure you've got some things you can definitely talk about. I don't have a, a lot recently that I can really talk about there's a computer game i've been playing a, a very old school one but i don't know that that's really that interesting although it's solo gaming technically so i don't <laughs> what know. is it uh colonization sid meyer's colonization i used he, to play that way back in the day way back way, way day. back in the day yeah this is dated like 95 i think when you started it says i don't even uh, think uh is there is there a version of it that works on modern os's yeah yeah it's on steam um, oh, okay. If you download Steam, which is a free download, you can mm-hmm. buy it, which I'm sure it's super cheap. I don't know. Let me look at the store page here real quick. Yeah, it's normally 20 bucks. I do own oh, Steam. Oh, and oh, Colonization, you mean? Uh, yeah, Colonization yeah. Classic, $6.99. Oh, you can buy wow. the Classic Explorer pack for $14.99, which includes Colonization oh, and also goodness. Covert Action. Covert Action was an awesome game back in the day. And Pirates oh, Gold Plus, which is another sure. awesome game. Anyway, I, yeah, Pirates Gold didn't that have like dueling? Yep, like yep, you could sure did. on on the deck of the ship. You could yep. duel, and it was all just button mashing, whatever. But kind of, it was yeah, very satisfying. Yeah. And then all the whole, you know, traveling to the different um, ports in in that area, like the, right. the Caribbean, I guess. Right. Yeah, yeah it was kind of cool. All right. Well, so here's colonization, and it's there's a Mac version. And it's twenty bucks. <laughs> well, that's probably why. The classic. No, 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 no. Okay, so colonization. Oh, this is colonization <laughs> four, released two thousand and eight. And oh yeah, no, no, no. Classic. That's, that's the remake. the The one is the original is from ninety four, ninety five, something like that. Ninety four. It says right here. Cool. My, micro Pro software. 
gosh, I miss those guys. Microprose, yeah. Yeah, back in the day. Oh, Master of Orion 1 is here. Oh, yeah. I used to play the heck and, out of uh, that as well. Master of Magic also is out there somewhere. And there's an expansion called Caster of Magic, which you can buy that will add a great deal of uh, modern, modernity to it. But it's not mm. like graphic improvements. It's just under the hood kind of stuff. I've not looked yeah. at it yet. I really should. Anyway, we should maybe start introing a podcast about that. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, we should probably do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 85 of the Solosaurus podcast. I'm Michael Eckenfels. And I'm Martin Gonzalez. And today on the show, we're going to talk about a variety of games rather than focus on just one. Nothing in particular. Nothing. In just particular. like an episode of Seinfeld, as we were saying. Anyway, you know that baseline is so thing. freaking annoying now. <laughs> <laughs> that was a pretty good uh, look at you. Yeah. Anyway, you should, you should do some voice work. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe I should. I don't know. I'm so old to just touch stuff. <laughs> so yeah, it's been kind of tough to, to sync our schedules up. I got a new puppy too, so it's been very mm. difficult for me to spend time. Learning. What's his name? Uh, yeah, Finn. 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 F-I-N-N. My daughter named him. She was going to, we were actually going to give the puppy to her, but we thought, no, we're going to keep it. And we'll probably, <laughs> but she's cool with that. Uh, we're probably going to get another, like a sibling to help keep him nice. company. And then uh, nice. she will take that other puppy home with her. So I don't know. We'll see. Have you generally been a doggy family or is this a new oh, yeah. new phase? Oh, okay. yeah. Right. We've, I mean, we've got a Bassett right now. He's 16, we think, 15, 16. Wow. And he just, he just wants to sleep and be left alone. And this little puppy wants to, rah, rah, you know, I play with me. That. And he's like, give me, give me alone. <laughs> yeah, we, we too have an OG here is about 12. And then the others uh, are all like four and five. And they're all full of energy. And yeah. he's like, I don't want to be bothered. Yeah. And then, he, yeah, he, he corners our old dog. And he's just like, go away, leave me alone. I'm hiding. <laughs> it's so funny. But anyway, this isn't Dog Show the podcast. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it could, <laughs> this could be. It could be. That's true. Uh, <laughs> uh, this podcast is brought to you by Stone Valley Games, your friendly distant game store. Check them out on stonevalleygames.com or look them up on Facebook under Stone Valley Games. Did you know that their prices are within a few dollars of a major competitors? They offer two distinct differences, though. First, they run their e-commerce business like a local shop. In other words, they care. They package items to make the trip and provide a handwritten note and a little token of their appreciation, such as a sticker or a magnet, uh, with every order, except for items that are shipped via media mail because there's limitations as to what they can actually include in media mail uh, yep. packages. Yeah. The second difference is that they also offer monetary differences that matter, both through their loyalty system and with discounts on future orders through product reviews. Another reason discounts matter is that sometimes a game cannot be listed below a certain price. So by offering a loyalty system and a discount for the cart, this ensures that the product price follows the distribution rules, but the customers save in the end. And, you know, I'm going to need to figure out what that means. I know they call them stones. Like when you buy something, I think you get a certain number of stones. And that's probably yeah. a di applied as a discount. I should figure out what that means <laughs> because I made my uh -huh. first Stone Valley Games purchase last night. All and right. I hate to say I've been uh -huh. remiss in that regard, but I do think I need an intervention at some point. For, <laughs> <I believe. laughs> what what happened? What was the damage? <laughs> well, a lot. I, this is kind of an early Christmas thing, but I think I'm done for this year and next year i just gotta stop mm -hmm. and it's just really hard right. you know? Some people know, yeah i know, I know. i've made that <laughs> promise before <laughs> me i will not buy any more board games and then future me mm -hmm. in the kermit dark side uh hoodie yes you will <laughs> that, <laughs> that lasts right up until the next deal rolls along and you're like oh that's been on my play on my uh, wish list bye <laughs> uh, well, when you hear more about what I've been doing lately, you'll go, oh, God, yeah, you really need an intervention. I mean, I bought NATO, uh -huh. The Cold War Goes Hot, Designer Signature Edition by uh, by Compass Games. It's a Victory Games, re it's a rehash of an old Victory Games title called NATO, The Next War in Europe. This one mm -hmm. is updated for a larger map, bigger hexes, and more accurate information that has come since the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and fall of communism, because this game was originally made in the 80s before they really had that intelligence. 
and now it's so supposed to be super awesome. It's rated 8.7 on BGG. So I was just like, oh, nice. God. Oh God, I need to get it. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. You know, the whole thing. I, I get that. Uh, in the 80s, I wasn't that intelligent. I hope I'm a little more intelligent now. <laughs> oh, I know the feeling. Trust me. Uh, Ishtar, that's a great movie. <laughs> I can't wait to see it. Uh, anyway. Uh, All then, right. So, so that was <laughs> NATO, the Cold War goes hot. Great title, yeah. by the way. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then uh, mm-hmm. Deep Space D6 Armada, the Kickstarter mm-hmm. edition, which uh, they yes. were selling. And I know you played that. I had the original. I, I traded the, it. I played the base kind of, you know, the core mechanism. Uh, uh-huh. I, I don't know because Armada includes a campaign, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have that. Yeah. It's a cooperative campaign, so you could play it solo and play multi-handed, I suppose. But uh, I watched yeah. a few videos. I was like, this is freaking cool. This is, you know, yeah. you can upgrade your ships, get experience uh, buy upgrades, things like that. And I thought, yeah, okay, I need to check that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you've also experienced this latest one, I believe, called Hunted Mining Colony 415 plus exclusives. Oh, you've, yeah. you've played it before and you like it a lot, right? Um, so I've played the Hunted series. So that's by Gabe Barrett. And mm-hmm. Gabe and I mm-hmm. have done a lot of collaboration over the past couple of years. Um, cool. Basically, he reached out to me to make... Uh, the print and play versions of these games, the Hunted series. So this is Mining Colony oh. 415, which is pretty much a, a alien, right? Or alien, <laughs> alien, right? And then uh, <laughs> nice, uh, but but it uses a dexterity me- mechanism for um, for combat. And then it when it kick started, it came out at the same time with Hunted mm, Kobayashi Tower, which was pretty much Die Hard. <laughs> That's what I thought. And, I wasn't sure. <laughs> And that uses a dice uh, resolution system for for combat, but they're basically the same thing. You're questing through some area, you're encountering things, you're finding items, and then you want to get to the big bad guy at the end and then defeat them. Uh, very very light, but very fun game. So yeah, uh, played both of these. In fact, I am <laughs> I am actually in a card for Hunted Kobayashi Tower. I'm, I'm an FBI agent. I forget my FBI really? agent name. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> My, it's the first time uh, I was uh, ever gamified. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm going to have yeah. to buy that now just so I have that. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 yeah, I don't know how you feel about dexterity games, but um, I, yeah. I like the theme of Mining Colony 415. Um, not that big of a fan of the dexterity mechanism. Interesting. Um, basically, you're, you're tossing uh, tokens into the box. And then there's targets in the box, and the closer you are to the center of the target, the better your um, effect on target. Interesting. Um, yeah, huh. uh, I, I I prefer the dice resol- the more traditional quote unquote uh, dice resolution mechanism of Kobayashi Tower, but very fun game and 15, 20 minutes to play a game top. So yeah, very cool. fast. Yeah, I don't, I do not own a dexterity resolution type of game anywhere in my collection. So that's one thing that admittedly intrigued me about this. Is yeah. how that's how that works, and from what you just said, that makes me say, "Hey, this is, this might be a nice change of pace." So that's kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, then tell us, uh, give us an update. Tell us uh, how you like it after you get to play it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe we can have an episode on it. I don't know if there's enough there to maybe do a full solo episode on that, but maybe we can do one or two. I don't know. We could we could collect. We could like collect. A, here's a whole bunch of light solo games in the same kind of genre, yeah. and yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, good idea. Okay. Now, this next one I've got is one I know you've posted about and you absolutely mm. adore it. It's called mm-hmm. Hadrian, Hadrian's Wall. Ah, oh, so good. <laughs> it's c- c- combo-tastic. <laughs> and this is, yeah, this is part of my grow- growth as a oh, gamer to, you know, do more I... engine building, card-driven type of stuff instead of just hex encounter war games. Yeah. And uh, your, your glowing appraisal of it, plus my research, I was like, okay. Okay. Everyone who's tried it. like <laughs> here's the thing about Hadrian's Wall. People look at it because it's essentially a roll and write and very, very, very detailed, and it's two sheets. And when you take pictures of it and you post it on social media, others who don't, are not familiar with the game, they're like, "What is that? Is that Excel? <laughs> is that a spreadsheet in yeah, game yeah. form?" And it yeah. really it looks really intimidating, but then you get into it, and uh, you know how you know complex rules turn me off. Well. You know, the, the rules are pretty straightforward. And it's the kind of thing where just one thing just leads to another. It's like, okay, I think I'm going to do this thing. Aha. And then it opens up this other thing. And all of a sudden, you're like, 
a dozen different combo moves deep and you're like, this turn isn't over yet. Oh my gosh, it's great. Cool. It's, I mean, if you like that, that sort of stuff, which I do. Um, so yeah, uh, once again, I'm very excited to hear how, you know, how it hits you. Good. Yeah, that's admittedly it, that had a lot of influence on why I added that to my cart because I was like, okay, I got to try this as well. And Merchant's Cove which I know is something we discussed on the show previously in news yeah. items. And I think you've mentioned as well, you've played. Oh, that, I, correct? I purchased it. I, I yeah. bought it. Yeah, I, that's I right. found that's a right. deal yeah. on the base game and mm -hmm. I ended up at the urging of um, urging. Uh, it's, it's like he personally urged me to uh, Michael Kelly of the one-stop co-op shop. I watched three of his videos <laughs> in preparing, in preparing myself to learn this game. And basically he said, look, you, this game really comes to life. It's a great base game, but it really comes to life with the extra content in the hidden something. I forget the, the name of the expansion, but I ended up buying that as well. But I haven't actually tabled the expansion, but I have played the base game. This game is a mood. It's a whole thing. Cool. It's super lavish production. I mean, I don't know how you feel about like assembling um, cardboard, like paper craft and cardboard stuff, but prepare for that. Like when you first okay. open up this box, there's a bunch of stuff. There's a bunch of boats and a bunch of <laughs> sail shelves that you have to um, fold together and, and, and whatnot. But uh, it's, it's, I, I like a game, you know, it's after all that, it's, it was a lot lighter than I expected it to be, but yeah, it's, um, it's fun. It's fun. Definitely. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to how you feel about it. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to checking it out. Like I, I when I first read about it, I was like, "Oh my god, this sounds so cool!" And I'm, it is. Oh yeah, that's right. I need to get that. It, too. <laughs> I, I wrote on social media that's like I, I would have liked to be in that pitch meeting. It was like, "Hey, hey guys, let's take a typical uh, economic resource conversion selling merchant buying selling euro, but then let's just make each player have a different asymmetrical, completely different game mechanism. Mm -hmm. And everybody's like passing around, you know, substances and going, yeah, I think that's a great idea, man. <laughs> 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 we should probably, at the start of this episode, there has to be those, those icons. Like at the start of the show, there's like, uh Oh, there's a, um, references to drug use in this in this episode. <laughs> disclaimer. Language, disclaimer. Yeah, you know. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, I know well. this is a family show. I apologize. Oh, yeah. I can edit that part out. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But yeah, it's bananas. Uh, but anyway, that's that's cool. I look forward to that one. And then there was another one that caught my eye called Rush MD, which is yeah. What's a, that? Uh, let's see. It is a game where it's a cooperative game, but you can play it solo where you play a doctor that you that's just been hired at a new cutting edge medical center where you have to cooperate to admit, diagnose and treat various patients who need help. And, you know, we've talked about this before. I've got a soft spot for yeah. medical driven type of games. And this looks kind of cool. There's uh, there's hourglasses here. So there's obviously some kind of timing mechanism in it. Um, Act, there's also, yeah. so it, it, it looks pretty cool. One to four players, four rounds, yeah. four minutes each. So it sounds like it's a very quick play. And I thought, well, we'll see, um, it, that the graphics look a little cartoony on the cover, but I'm okay with that if the gameplay is good. So we yeah. will see how that goes. Apparently there's a syringe as a component. Oh, there is. Yes. Or maybe they just added a syringe as, <laughs> yeah, that is real time. I'm looking at it on, on well, Game Geek right now. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's, <laughs> syringe look, looks uh, looks like a component, so that's kind of cool. And solo mode designed by David Turchi. David He's Turchi. so hot right now. He's everywhere. He's he designs awesome. every solo mode. It's great. Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and then last but not least, I know you've talked about this one before too. I own yeah. the football version of it, but I also yeah. ordered Baseball Highlights 2045. Such a good game. Yeah. Love that game. <laughs> and I that's so good. When I reasons. when I finally got it to the table, I played it, I don't know, like 10 times in a row. It was great. Sorry, wow. go ahead. No, 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 yeah. no. That's that's fine. I, I, absolutely two reasons why I bought this is one, the football game, I really enjoyed it. The baseball game, I actually played it on my iPad several mm -hmm. years ago, yeah. and I liked it, but it wasn't. It didn't really get me like a board game would. And you talking yeah. about it was like, okay, there we go. That's it's, on the list. The, <laughs> the app is the app is a, a faithful rendition, and it's it's pretty basic. Um, you know, it mm -hmm. gets the job done. But 
I don't know. The, uh, there's just I, I'm one of those people that just something about the physical. Right. Even though you're playing the exact same game, the fact that you're playing it physically just makes a real big difference for me. And you know, this is a deck building game, and I love deck builders. And I'm not necessarily a huge baseball fan, but you know, um, there have been times in my life when I I followed certain playoff races <laughs> for teams that I cared about. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah me so too. it's. That, you know, uh, I look at baseball highlights 2045 as some a perfect after work, long day of work, and you've got a little bit of time before you have to start your evening rituals and, you know, chores and whatnot, and you can fit it in. And it's it's like a palate cleanser of a game. So, yeah, I like that. Good like deal. That. Awesome. Yeah, you, you had some really, really good uh, choices there, man. You should feel good about that. I, I mean, I, you know, separate from <laughs> people still needing a intervention, but, you yeah. know. Uh, once we see that aside, it's like, yeah, some really great games in there. <laughs> yeah. I need another add-on to the house to store all these frigging games, let me tell you. <laughs> hey, you know, I've, uh, speaking of that, I did. Something that I've done recently is I actually started selling games. And I, I, I there was this <gasps> block in yes. my mind uh, about like, oh, I don't know how to sell. Like, we've, if you've not done it before, it's like you, you haven't crossed that line. And then you're like... It's so hard. Where do I go? Uh, you know, I don't want to like overspend on um, shipping and da 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 and this and that. Well, mm -hmm. as it turned out, what happened in my case was it was pretty simple. I had I, I'd been keeping a lot of my multiplayer games that I didn't play anymore since transitioning full time to solo. I'd been keeping them in my shed uh, in the backyard. Well, my son fixed up the shed as a hangout spot, or a clubhouse for him and his friends, and he pushed all my board games out. And so I was trying, so I had to put them in the garage. Um, and then I posted a picture of all these board games on shelves in the garage to the, uh, you know, social media. And people were like, oh, you know, whatever. They were doing the usual stuff. Like, don't put them in your garage, moisture, right. blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. in Northern California, moisture's not a thing. <laughs> and then um, uh, someone, a uh, nice fellow from Phoenix, he's like, he PMs me, Facebook Messenger, and he goes, hey, I'm setting up a, um, board game lounge for the community in phoenix which how how far are you from phoenix i Mike, live Michael. in i yeah i live i live thereabouts actually yeah, yeah. where we're <laughs> at we're at in phoenix yeah uh i mean i don't have the exact location but he's like and he but anyway he, he looked, told me a little about the project and he goes look the picture of the games you posted in your garage perfect i'll how much do you want for them and i'm like I basically quoted him. I, I wasn't trying to make money on the games. I just basically wanted them gone. Um, and we agreed. Uh, long story short, I ended up selling over 100 games in over the two weeks to this person to, to help stock his, um, his board game lounge. And I also learned about shipping and how UPS is your best option if you're selling, if you're shipping that many games. Right. Um, it's the cheapest option, not not FedEx and not USPS, not not USPS. But anyway, that was great, and now now I feel a lot more confident. It's like um, I I can do that now. That's an option for me. Is is I I, can, I now know how to sell games. I feel much more empowered. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is kind of a cleansing experience to to get rid of some and have more room on your shelves for other games. <laughs> but you'll exactly. have to tell me. You'll have to tell me the name of that place. I could probably go visit him actually, and uh, mm -hmm. might find it interesting. Hey, I work with Martin, so hey. After the episode, know. I can I can send him a Facebook message and get more more information. Sure, cool. That would be that'd be great. Awesome. awesome. Maybe I'll have some things I can I can yeah get rid of. <laughs> Maybe right. he'll have a whole section on war games. Maybe you never know. <laughs> so. Let's do a new segment. Let's let's talk about some solo gaming news. Uh, so it's been a while. Yeah. I, the last time, I don't think we had a full-on uh, segment from Table4One.me, but this segment is brought to us by Table4One.me, where we usually exclusively get our one-player game news. Uh, thanks to uh, Frederick Schultz, as always, of mm -hmm. Table4One.me for his ongoing efforts to bring us the solo gaming news. So the first one that we'd like to talk about you is a talk about you talk to you about <laughs> is called well, blah, 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 is called a uh, kick well okay so it's a kickstarter campaign that just launched for a game called heroes of the shire mm -hmm. it is a english-based publisher by the name of senior games 
Uh, it is a turn-based fantasy adventure for one to six players designed by Damien Sr. and featuring artwork by Edwin Hayo. Uh, it features a heavy emphasis on story progression and leveling up your character, harking back to the classic choose-your-own-adventure style of books and games from yesterday. So right there, they've got me just because I'm interested in, in leveling up characters and having some kind yeah. of story progression as well as CYOA kind of stuff because I grew up oh, yeah. those books. As, as a lot of people did. So you love them too, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition to being able to play through scenarios, either cooperatively or solo, the game system also features competitive play. But who wants to do that? Come on, you don't play with other people. We don't <laughs> play solo. So why, I'm not even going to mention that part. Why, why don't I even read that? Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, that's <laughs> it's there. If you do have uh, multi multiple players that you want to introduce them if to. If you the game, have then, actual you friends, you can use you can use this game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's that? People that live near me? Ugh. Coming to contact with people? Ugh. Well, so it looks like the solo mode is an add-on. It offers a true solo mode experience for players to run a scenario embodying one hero of their choice. And while exploring tiles in the scenario mode, action cards are frequently used. Uh, solo mode add-on has some exclusive actions that are not available in the regular action card deck, which sounds interesting. Uh, Neat. Uh, what do you think, Martin, looking at this? I'm looking at the uh, news item right now, and I'm reacting to that, what they said about the solo mode, because it's, it's got a co-op mode, right? So you, yep. if you want to play it solo, you can just play two characters, uh, in two co-op characters, and that'll work. But they're saying that they have an add-on solo mode offering a true solo mode experience. Um Generally speaking, to me, that's a red flag, <laughs> right? It's like yeah. it tells me that um, the solo mode was not really considered from the get go. And when you say the when you say the for the, the word add on or, or the phrase add on, my question is: that, Does that mean I have to pay extra for the true solo mode? Question mark because that's a turn off <laughs> to me. Um, That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking at the picture, you know, like the the character style looks semi. It's, it's a cross between cartoony and realistic, so that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And the I'm um, looking at the uh, picture they have of a character card, and then I guess a card where all of the different abilities are there. And I mean, the graphic design is okay. It's pretty dark. I don't know. It's not. It's not grabbing me right off the bat here, Michael. Right. No, I that's fine. I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. The other thing too that, <laughs> that grabs me is Shire, the word Shire, because the only place I've ever heard the word Shire is Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. but this doesn't look like it has anything to do with Lord of the Rings. And I would think that no. I would read that and go, oh, it's a L-O-T-R game. No, it's not. I don't, don't, don't think so. It doesn't mention it. It doesn't look like it. So no, that's interesting. Um, yeah. Shire is not exactly a trademark word, I don't think, but still kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For right. Shire. Sorry. Sorry. Insert insert uh but I'm dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> All so right. What's uh, next? Next item. Uh Stonemeyer Games, a very, very small outfit you've never heard of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> announces an expansion to Tapestry, a second expansion. This one's called Art and Architecture. And Oops. as you might imagine, because it's a Stonemeyer game designed by Jamie Stegmeyer and Mike Young, this latest expansion supports solitaire play. Thank you very much. Courtesy of the fine folks at Automa Factory, Morton Monrad Peterson, and that merry bunch of uh, solo divisors. In addition to adding new civilizations, tapestry cards, and of course, the ever so impressive landmark miniatures, the arts and architecture expansion also introduces a fifth advancement tracks because four just wasn't enough, providing even more options for how you want to evolve your empire. Um, so that sounds very interesting. Michael, uh, do you actually own and have you played tapestry? Because I haven't. Yes, I do have tapestry. Mm. I love All tapestry. Right. If How do you feel you go about in, this? It looks interesting. Just So the thing that got me into tapestry, I know that there's people that love it and people that hate it. And the mm -hmm. people that love it say, okay, it looks like a Civ game, but it's not really a Civ game. It's more of like an Euro game just wrapped in a civilization type blanket that's not really civilization progression. And if you understand that and go into it, you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of it than thinking it's like a civilization game. Because it's it's hard not to see it otherwise, because that's 
how it looks and but it's it's a fantastic it's been a while since i played it but it's a fantastic game i love the minis i love the components and uh and i just realized i typed this in wrong into the uh into the script it's not arts and artistry it's arts and architecture um mm-hmm. i don't have the first expansion to it but or, or the second one i'm uh, you know i'm gonna have to wait played a few more times before i go and buy expansions <gasps> gasp i know right uh <laughs> waiting to see if you like a game before you buy all the expansions <laughs> Um, I like that's, what I. That's not how we do things around here. We buy no. the expansion even before the base game. Exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, I'm being I'm being facetious, of course. I <laughs> hardly ever get expansions unless Michael Kelly of the One Stop Co op Shop basically twists my arm to in the form of. Video. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I help me understand this part uh, that it mm-hmm. says that the expansion supports solitaire play. So does that mean that the base game doesn't? Question mark. You can play the solo against an autonomy, I believe. It's been a while since I played it. I got this in the summer and I played it once and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was an autonomy. Um, okay. I don't even know what I'm talking yeah, it was, about. Uh, <laughs> like Stegmeier, Stonemeyer Games and Automa Factory have basically been joined at the hip for years. But since uh, they first devised the Automa for uh, Viticulture, if I'm not horribly mistaken, that was in 2015. And then they worked together on Sife's Automa. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. Anyway. Cool. Yeah, that's right. uh, so. So yeah. So uh, you say you like the game. You you I, like tapestry. I, I had a good feeling. I like to say I can't remember hardly the events because there've been so many games since then. But yeah, it's it's an autonomous driven type of game. Solo, you can play it uh, in competition, mm. of course, with other players if you have friends, as we've said. But uh, I, I like I the know. production value of it. It's a very expensive game too. So if you, I do some research before buying it, but I was just like, you know. There's just enough people that like this, and it's civilization-ish, and it's in a vein that is something I want to explore more of, so that's why I pulled the trigger on it. And just my initial impression of it is that it's a interesting game to play, as long as you're not going into it thinking it's like right. Sid Meier's Civilization or something like right, that. You right, know? right, right. So it's not um, a Civ game, it's Civ-adjacent. <laughs> I, that's That would be my opinion. I think others might disagree, but I think that's exactly exactly All the right. nail on the head there, yeah. All right. I, I may be asking for a friend. I don't know. <laughs> that friend's name is Martin and has a last name that begins with a G. <laughs> and, and looks very similar to me. It's weird. It's really weird. Yeah, it's very okay. odd. <laughs> Your identity has been stolen, man. <laughs> All righty. The third one, if I can get back to that and cut out this dead air here. Here we go. It's Garp Hill Games unveiling wayfarers of the south tigris and mm. ever since release of viscounts viscounts of the west kingdom we talked about this on one episode i can't remember how yeah, he's pronounced it it's viscounts yeah with viscounts whatever the final entry to the west trilogy people have been eagerly anticipating news about the next trilogy from the publisher and that day has apparently come now as they have unveiled wayfarers of the south tigris which marks the beginning of a new trilogy of games created by in-house design duo Shem Phillips and S.J. McDonald, with artwork provided by longtime collaborator and artist The Miko. If this is a one-to-four-player game, which features dice placement as a central game mechanism. Now, I mention this because it's here. It's the third story. I don't think I can get... Well, okay, hold on. Let's talk about this really quick. It says it's going to head to Kickstarter in 2022, so it'll be a while before it hits the table to, with anybody. There are people that love this series of games. I'm very eh on it. And I think we discussed this at length previously. So I don't know if we want to go down that rabbit hole again. But did you not say uh, it's kind of like the, the art is kind of cool. I kind of liked it because it was my first experience with it. But I think you had mentioned something about it being OK. Enough is enough. Right. Or yeah. So, remember? well, very quick, very quickly. Like, I mean, they know what they're doing. Garfield Games. Shem Phillips, S.J. McDonald, and the Miko, they're, they're a solid team. Of course. And they design solid games. They're very tight. They're very accurate. They're, they're very, you know, they're very precise. Um, for, for people who, people who uh, are, love their games, love them a lot. Um, so my, my reaction to the artwork in particular was that the first time anyone sees the Miko's artwork, it's like, wow, this is great. It's a, yep. such a great style, blah, blah, blah. Um, but then after playing six 
games <laughs> of you know yeah. playing uh, the North Sea series and the West Kingdom series, and they're all art by the Miko, and they're all basically just character portraits, just various you know iterations of character portraits. It, it, it got to be a bit much. And so mm-hmm. at the time that we were talking about, I think it was Architects of the West Kingdom where you and I were talking, so a few episodes back, at that time I was kind of like done, you know, with the whole thing. Not, uh, not that it's not, it's not, it's not bad. It's just like, you know, personally, I can, can we see something different? But then I, I played a game with the Miko artwork, Merchant's Cove, as a matter of fact, after we talked about it, where it's not character portrait. It's actually like... Turns out the Miko can draw things aside from character portraits, and it's amazing. It's amazing. It's the so so I I became re-energized with my appreciation of the Miko's artwork uh, because of Merchant's Cove. So um, so that's that's kind of like my evolution, my evolution on the on on, on that aspect of it. Um, cool. As for okay. this game, Wayfarers of the South Tigris, and kicking off a whole new. Uh, trilogy of games. Okay, that's interesting. And the fact that it's dice placement. Uh, I like dice placement me- mechanism. Um, I wonder if it's dice placement or dice as workers. I, I want to find out more about that. But, you know, they specialize in worker placement mechanism, various shades of worker placement. So I'm, I'm guessing it's dice as workers. But anyway, um, I, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm, um, yeah. So that, that's might, kind of how I feel about this one. Okay. Yeah, it might be interesting. It does say it, uh, of course, being the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins, and these points are generated primarily by mapping land, water, and sky. And I kind of like the sound of that mechanic in the form of, you know, you're exploring a land that is new and, you know, nobody else has discovered it. That's kind of cool for me. So that might actually make it a good angle. I guess it's going to... The judgment judgment will be reserved until until it is in our hands, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean they they've got such a massive street cred in the gaming industry with their track record. Um, they're pretty much the most bankable ticket in in, yeah. in like worker placement games in True. gaming right now. So there's no way this isn't going to be massively successful, uh, in right, my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Garpill and Stonemaier, two publishers that never make anything, and here we go, more more games from them. <laughs> Why did you talk about such obscure publishers for our news segment? <laughs> you know, it's all about the news, man. It's all about the news. So, all right. yeah, we we we've talked at length about a lot of games, and we've not quite even scratched the surface yet, ladies and gentlemen. So, hold on to your hats. What? Uh, we should talk about what we've been playing lately. And Martin, I know you've been very busy lately with a lot of games, which uh, I'd love to hear yeah. more about that. Yeah, I've been playing and I've been re-theming and I've been making a solo Otoma and just a whole bunch of stuff since we last talked. Um, I'll, I'll Let me let me kick it off by saying um, the most recent game that's been on my table, in fact, it was just yesterday, is called The Artemis Project. This was a game uh, designed by Daniel Chow and Daniel Rochi, published by Grand Gamers Guild in 2019, so a little over two years ago. Uh, This is a dice as workers placement game. Um, And the solo mode features, it puts you, you're pitted up against two drone players. And the, you know, it couldn't be easier to control them. Basically, uh, they have their own set of dice and then you roll a d6 that tells you where on the board they're going to start placing and then one drone goes before you and places clockwise in order and then you play normally and then the other drone will come after you and place counterclockwise so um basically their job is to make it tougher for you to get resources and whatnot on the on the board um so it's a worker placement game using dice as workers it's got a really cool innovative uh, exposure mechanism basically you place uh, your dice um, on a on a track, and you're you're saying, "Hey, if, uh, if if the round ends, and let's say you put a four there for energy, for uh, you know the vent, and you want to get a four. If the round ends and your dice is still uh, there, you're going to get four energy. But the interesting thing is, uh, the drone could place a three to the left of your dice, and then steal three dice before your dice gets resolved. Right, so they could potentially get all of the energy before it gets to your dice. 
because so 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 lower so so it actually uh, um, rewards lower value dice, um, which is kind of like cool because you know sometimes in other games it's like the higher the dice roll the better, right? So well this one has places where lower value dice are rewarded and then places where higher value dice are, re are rewarded. So that uh, expands your kind of you know placement options. Um, it's it's a really really cool theme. You are a team of terraformers trying to competing with other terraformers teams of terraformers to colonize Jupiter's moon of Europa. I believe that's Jupiter's moon, right? Not Saturn's moon. Um and uh the artwork is super cool. It's very very like colorful. It looks great on the table. Um but the other nice thing is that the board isn't that big. So Unlike other like worker placement games, we could mention with gi gigantic table presence, just <laughs> table footprint, like Lost Ruins of Arnak. I'm looking at you. It takes up nearly three quarters of the table. It does, and uh, people actually are like, I don't know where to sit. <laughs> you know, like to be able to reach everything. So this is a game uh, with a compact table presence, and I just enjoyed it. I mean. I don't know, Michael. Does that happen to you? Where that's just like a game. You try it out, and and it just sits really, really well. And as soon as you finish it, you want to play it again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I got that from that's, Lost that's Ruins of Arnak. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry. I got that from Lost Ruins of Arnak. Also, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that game a lot. And this one is actually one that I almost bought. Yes, night from Stone Valley Games. Not to just name drop again, but I like this kind of. Uh, subject matter and there was actually a movie that came out recently called um or not recently maybe a few years ago called europa report i believe that's uh -huh. it's not a it, it, yeah i wouldn't go looking for it unless you're okay with horror or horror or scary type movies because there's a lot of uh, tension in that one but it's a good movie from that regard and i saw this and i went oh my gosh that's like europa report but it's a board game oh that's so cool oh my gosh <laughs> i don't I, I don't know why i didn't get it i think there were too many other shinies uh, but yeah, that, that looks really cool. I like the look of that. That's going to be on my list for when I'm ready to buy games again. <laughs> yeah. So that was the first. Of, that's that's just the um, that's just my opening salvo, Michael. But uh, exactly. let's let's switch over to you. What's been going on? Oh, I don't have much other than <laughs> having enough games to last me like ten more years now. So what's the point? But you know, <laughs> um, I've been. And this might be a long, a little bit of longish story here, but I've. I do have a tear that I've been on recently for Shadows of Brimstone, mm -hmm. which is it started as this old west slash horror mashup where this mm -hmm. the world has been infused with uh, this new element called Darkstone. It's very valuable and it can be forged into weapons or armor or other useful items, but it's very rare. So that's why it's so valuable. And uh, this has had the side effect of opening gates to other worlds and causing uh, foul creatures to come through, of course. And these core sets are based in the American West or American Old West. Uh, City of the Ancients is one and sh uh, Swamps of Death is the other. And they are basically adventuring through mines. And then there's some minor interaction with local towns as well that are included in these base sets. So they're pretty cool if you're into old west slash horror like i am uh i'm probably one of the few people that liked cowboys and aliens myself but uh, <laughs> the movie um i, I do kind of like this kind of sci-fi horror old west thing going on um so originally i bought city of the ancients and then i had mm -hmm. the frontier town expansion and caverns of cinder expansion but this was a few years ago back when i before i moved and i thought you know, I'm never going to use play this game. I never got it to the table. I started assembling the minis, and I was oh, just never got to it. So I'm like, I just got to sell it because I need the room. And so I did, and I always regretted it. Always, 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 I never got to the table. So earlier this year, I traded somebody for City of the Ancients and Swamps of Death, and then I ended up buying the um, the uh, Frontier Town expansion. So mm. there's a lot of stuff there under the hood immediately. I mean, we got minis that have to be assembled, which is kind of a pain. I mean, if you, you remember from our days of uh, Alien and other Aliens, another glorious day oh. in the core, <laughs> putting together aliens. No, the, <laughs> you had to go mention that again. Oh, oh boy. Well. These are actually a lot easier to assemble. And then there's okay. painting, 
which I don't paint and I want to paint. So I bought these paints, I bought these brushes and all these other things. But the story doesn't stop there. I, I got these corsets, I got this expansion. Um, it, it, what you might want to know a little bit more about how the game plays. So it's it's a card driven, dice rolling, combat heavy minis game. There's mm-hmm. lots of minis, there's lots of super cool bits like terrain tiles that you mm-hmm. go exploring in a mine or or other locations and you just you know randomly build it and there's rules to how how it gets laid out and it's just really really cool how it how it plays um i i just i love the i love the overall feel of it and i'm going to get into it sooner or later here because i just um recently bought a, another corset <laughs> <laughs> wait you bought two cores no no, no. I, I i had the traded for the two original corsets earlier this year uh, uh but i just got a uh, a bundle with Forbidden Fortress, which is another mm-hmm. corset. It's the third corset, and this one has to deal deals with ancient Japan, feudal Japan, I should say. Oh. So it's a different setting, but it's the same premise. Um, it, it's it's really fascinating, also because it comes with two other expansions that are sold separately. But I got it in this bundle. One's called Temple of Shadows, and the other's called Forest of the Dead. Um, then I bought the Feudal Village expansion as well, which does for this what. Uh, Frontier Town does for the Old West corsets. And it's essentially comes with a mounted board for the town. It comes with these adventures you can do, like bank robbing or, you know, all these various things that you can do in the town that makes it a lot more interesting than just rolling on a table to see what happens. Uh, there's a lot of that, but, you know, it's just, I, I don't know. I think I've gone a little bit overboard, but I have assembled <laughs> the minis for the Flying, for the flying Fortress. <laughs> wow. For the Forbidden Fortress. Uh, game set. I've got the minis and I'm looking at them right now. I just need time to to prime them and start painting. And like I said, we got this puppy and it's like nobody has time for that. <laughs> Why did I do this? But I didn't foresee that happening. So, so um, I guess that my basic question is what possessed you to just go all in on this and all the expansions and the painting and the mini? Uh, like like what, 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 what basically... You just wake up one day and it's like, you know what? I want Shadows of Brimstone back into my life. Because <laughs> I got a I got a problem. You know, I got a problem. <laughs> I'm an addict, I think. <laughs> There's something to be said about, you know, ordering a board game and then waiting for it to arrive like it's Christmas freaking morning, you know? Yeah. Um, this this kind of thing, like I said, I, I always I regretted it for years not having uh, getting rid of it. And I'm looking uh-huh. at like the Caverns of Cinder expansion today. I've not seen it for less than $175, which is nuts. Uh-huh. I would never ever spend that much on, a, on an expansion but i'm like i should have kept it and now i had the chance to get this stuff cheap and i'm like yes uh, i'm doing gotcha, it gotcha gotcha I, I love this theme i'm not gonna skip out on it again i'm gonna paint these minis and i'm actually gonna play it and i have got this idea in my head of doing this massive uh a gaming report kind of a thing or maybe a video playthrough i don't know because the worlds of feudal japan and the old west can mix so you can mm-hmm. technically put cowboys or u.s marshals from the old west into feudal japan or samurai and ninjas into the old west i mean it's just this freaking cool concept i just love it i don't know <laughs> <laughs> would you say that this is like the weird west uh kind of milieu or genre um yeah. I, i've heard that kind of bandied about it's like um western but with like supernatural elements yep. or yep. magic or whatnot yeah absolutely okay. yep zombies uh demons uh yeah evil creatures uh, all kinds of stuff. Flying Frog has a series of games. Uh, Touch of Evil as well, you know. Yep. Yep. Th- th- but th- they're all kind of similar in that they use uh, photos uh, or like, like stylized photos for the uh, for the card art. Does this use the use a similar similar style, or is it like drawings or paintings? Not in, not in this case. No, this is drawn. This is all drawn stuff. So those gotcha. that game you're talking about, it does do that. They also do that in another product of theirs called. Um, uh, Fortune and Glory, which I uh, own, yeah, yeah, and I yeah. will never get rid of because it's very much Indiana Jones ish type of a game. Yeah, but they do use photorealistic. I mean, photorealistic. They do use actors in costume for their characters, which is really cool in that. And I think they now, do that in. Sorry, go yeah. ahead. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, Shadows no, no, no. of Brimstone says it's a co op game, right? Yeah, it is co op, but uh, you know, in my opinion, any co op game can be played solo. And in case, yeah, 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 no, fact, that, that's 
Because the only Flying Frog game I actually own is Last Night on Earth, which is their yes. zombie game. Yes, yes. But uh, there's no inbox uh, solo mode. Um, so I had to kind of make do. Um, and I, I, at the time, I conf- I only played it once and I didn't really look on, I'm sure on Board Game Geek, uh, they mm-hmm. have, you know, fan-made solo modes or whatnot. But um, yeah. I remember being feeling okay about it, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. but not but not great. Anyway, that's fair. Yeah, I, I owned that game myself too at one point, but I uh, got rid of it last year, year before, something like that. And I just never yeah. played it. And I just was kind of eh on it, but you know, it's a zombie. Great. Okay. Well, I just, it seems like a game that's more fun multiplayer than solo. You know, there's a lot more player interactivity and it's just yeah. a little bit more fun that way. And gasp, I know. Oh my gosh. I'm saying that there's probably games that are better with multiplayers, but we know this. What? Um, Blasphemy. Yeah, I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the only the only thing I gotta think about is you know there's a really good Facebook group for Shadows of Brimstone. Uh, if you're curious about it, you know go check it out. Maybe I think that uh, you know I was asking them questions and and they're very engaging and very friendly over there. So it's like this helped a lot to help get me drawn into it. And I'm seeing them post pictures of, hey, I got this, and I'm like, uh huh, I want that too. Uh huh, I want that too. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, it doesn't help when you join a group like that. You got enablers. Mm-hmm. And uh, but that's what we're seeking out te- technically in this hobby. Sometimes it's people we to want tell people us to help validate our insanity and make us yes. feel less insane. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's, absolutely. Although seeking I'm, out like-minded crazy people. Yep. And <laughs> that's why I love this hobby. That's why I love our audience because you all understand. I think, and I appreciate that. <laughs> you get me. You yes. really get me. Yes. All right. You complete me. <laughs> Anyway, what else you got, well, Martin? That sounds awesome, and I can't wait to hear more from the reports from the uh, the, the Wild Frontier with uh, Feudal Japan uh, Samurai and, and all that other stuff. Fully painted. I expect to see your incredible pictures on the, on the social media. Sooner or later. <laughs> all right. So um, I've been on a lighter games kick uh, fairly recently. So after Artemis Project, I got Wild Space to the table. This is a um, set collection game with a tableau building. Basically, the theme, if you can call it that, is you're a space captain and you are traveling to different planets and you're trying to hire the right people to join your crew. Every um, They're all space animals. Um, I guess. And um, every uh, card, every crew card has a couple of potentially two or three different icons on them. And so, you know, your basic game style is um, you add these to your hand and then you uh, have take actions that allow you to play certain cards from your hand to your tableau. And then you start scoring points for different sets. Um, And then there's cards that change up like, if you match this icon with this other icon, you'll get this much victory points. And then it's it's a kind of game that starts your brain thinking along multiple tr- simultaneous tracks of, should I go hard on that particular icon? Or should I go hard on the robots? Or should I go, or or, or how do I, you know? And th- the other thing is there's no hand limit. <laughs> so the, the, hmm. at one point I had 15 cards in my hand and I'm just like rearranging them. I was like, okay, I could do this. But then I rearrange them. I, I could also go like this. And, and 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 so the thing I will say about Wild Space is that um, it's light, but if you suffer from analysis paralysis, as I do, um, <laughs> you could be sitting there staring and reconfiguring your hand for hours <laughs> before actually making a move. And the game itself is... It's pretty compact and a simple design. Um, you, uh, uh, you you play 10 turns total, right? Um, it's got a very cool action selection system where you your tokens are ships, uh, and then you land on a planet, and then your choices are you could land another ship on a different planet, or you could explore the same planet. And each move that you... Landing it, uh, you know, unlocks, uh, allows you to do an action that's printed there, um, and then moving it allows you to do another action. So it's it's very kind of straightforward action selection mechanism. Um, and then the solo mode is um, kind of cool because you have a twelve card deck of AI cards called the um, they're they're hostile planets, and the AI player is called the smuggler. And um, the smuggler gets his own set of ships. And um, basically, it's like Lost Ruins of Arnak in that 
you can customize the difficulty level of the AI um, in the same way that Lost Ruins of Arnak has green AI cards, red AI cards, which are harder, and then purple AI cards, which you can download and print from the website that are even harder. And then you can mix and match them to kind of fine tune the difficulty of your AI player. Um, you can do the same thing here where it comes with 12 AI cards. And then if you select two of this color, two of this color and one of this color, that's the easy or it's all printed in the in the rule book or select these colors and then you can make a normal difficulty, select this mix of cards and then it's hard. You know, so I like that the it's got customizable difficulty. Um, that said, everything about the theme is completely irrelevant in this game. It is, <laughs> it is as dry and soulless and purely mechan mechanism based as you could possibly imagine. Mm. Um, on paper, I should have liked this one because it's about you know combos, figuring out all these like Arnak, right? Like you figure out all these combos and and you know score the most points. But right, uh, I was expecting some sort of you know nice kind of combo thing feeling like I get from Arnak or Hadrian's Wall, but uh, I, did, I hated it. <laughs> I really wow. did not like Wild Space. So, wow. uh, yeah, I feel bad. I, I feel very disappointed about that. That's a shame. I mean, I'm looking at it now. It looks kind of cool, but once you said that, it's like, well, okay, I guess the animal theme is not really going to do anything to save it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if I had, if I cared more about the gameplay, I would have rethemed this game to... What was I thinking about? Um, video game characters, like classic video game characters. So oh, well. basically, hmm. uh, you are a uh, you are a uh, classic video games aficionado, and you're trying to collect as many classic video game characters to your collection as possible. You know, uh, Sonic, Mario, um, you know, Link, Samus, uh, all all those classic. I, right, I, I right. felt that that would have been slightly more interesting to me than. Um, the the kind of nondescript space animals, but anyway, uh, <laughs> as it turns out, well, I don't care about the gameplay enough to actually take the effort to retheme this game, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> makes sense. All right. Yeah, I like the publisher's name. Uh, Pandasaurus. Yeah, Pandasaurus. They're, they're pretty. Uh, they're pretty. They do a lot of stuff. Uh, Dinosaur Island is one of their more prominent ones. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I've heard of that one. Yeah. Cool. All right. What else has I, been going on, Michael? Well, I can't really, I don't have much else to, to talk about, though I did recently get some RPG acquisitions. It has nothing to do with solo gaming. And when I buy an RPG, it's usually just to read it for source material. And mm -hmm. one that I found very fascinating is the Aliens RPG, the new one mm -hmm. that just came out recently by Free free league publishing i think it's uh i got that and i got the colonial marine source book as well gotcha and it's so cool <laughs> to read there's so much backstory there's so much goodness in it if you're an aliens fan even if you're not not a role player you know you might look at it to see because it's 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 production quality is through the roof and it's just a fantastic looking little game so uh yeah, that's I, I read maybe six pages I've had time for, <laughs> but uh, the Colonial Marines manual is especially super cool. I and mean, there's there's a lot of in game stuff in it, but there's a lot more just backstory, like how the Colonial Marines were formed, their history, uh, stuff like that. So awesome. That's good. How about you? Um, you got more? I've never heard of this aliens. I'm, I'm not too familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> Being I'm, facetious. Obligatory right. reference, but I think you caught me. You beat me to it earlier in this podcast episode. So yeah, that's cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, right, right. When we're talking about the the Gay Barrett games. Um, okay, so another one that I've been playing recently, another light uh, game is called Furnace, by designed by Ivan Lashin, published by Hobby World. Now, this is a pure engine building game. And the theme is you are 19th century captains of industry, and you are... Uh, putting together, you're literally building a factory in your in your hand in your tableau, and the cool thing about this game is that um, it's got an auction mechanism. So um, it the the box says you play with two to two to five players, I think, and every player gets it's a two to four, two to five. Every player gets a set of discs numbered one through four, and uh, there's a there's an offer, there's a market of uh, cards every turn. And you play four turns, uh, four rounds, I believe. 
but basically every round starts with every player would you know take a turn place place a numbered disc on the card and that indicates how much you're bidding on the cards and then so everybody takes turns if you place the highest number on a card the highest number is a 4 that basically means you're assured of getting that card because you cannot you cannot place the same bid on on the same card like you can't have two fours um, there's no tie resolution. So basically, if you placed the highest number in that card, you're going to get that card. Um, the cards are multi-use, which I love. I love multi-use cards. Um, so, But the, the interesting thing about the auction is that there's benefits to winning the card and adding it to your tableau. But there's also benefits to not winning the card because you can get resources and not from the card, but not get the card into your tableau. So there's like a consolation prize. And sometimes you need that consolation prize. So sometimes you're hoping you want to win it and sometimes you're hoping to be outbid. So that was kind of a cool um, uh, mechanism. Now, you might be saying to yourself, auction mechanism, Martin, how do you solo play that? Well, as it turns mm -hmm. out, <laughs> um, in the box, there's actually rules for, uh, in the rule book, it says, if you're playing two players, you need to add a dummy third player who's got their own auction discs and then there's rules for how they place. Um, basically, I think it's like um, they place from lowest to highest. A anyway, so I'm not going to go into the, the placement, but they're there. And I'm like, well, so, so because basically, so so the minimum player count is three, right? So if you're playing a two-player game, you add a dummy player. And I'm like, well, why don't I just take those same rules and add a second dummy player? And then I can hmm. solo play this game. And as it turns out, that's... It was exactly right. And I'm like, why didn't they add that solo? <laughs> what? Why didn't they add that to the rules? You know, like it, it seems like a no brainer to me. But anyway, yeah, so that's what I did. I played two dummy players. Um, they basically each one uses a D6 to dictate where, they, where they're going to put their, um, their discs. Um, and, uh, and then basically I'm, I'm playing normally and I'm just trying to, build my engine and score the most points you know so it's a it's a tableau builder it's an engine builder it's an efficiency kind of optimization game um hmm. very much in the same vein as similar games like it's a wonderful world um like um oh man i suppose terraforming mars aries expedition but um uh this one oh this one plays super fast and so i you know and I really enjoyed it. There's just something super satisfying about like um, reconfiguring the cards and then starting your engine and then seeing what happens. Almost like a Rube Goldberg, um, you know, uh, crazy machine, uh, you know, uh, invention type thing. Um, yeah. And so far, I think my highest score is 63 or 62, which isn't very good. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, so I'm crap at this, but I just love it. I, I just love just make it literally building an engine build, building a factory again it's one of those things where the theme could be anything it really really doesn't matter but um mm -hmm. i'm a sucker for this this type of you know this type of tableau engine building game i i, I may have a, a, apart from deck building i probably have <laughs> so many in my collection now and i just love all the different flavors of them it's not like one of those situations where it's like well i already have this one so i don't need another one in the same genre i'm like no no i, I need them all <laughs> exactly right but yeah, what do you think about what i just laid out there i've <laughs> i've heard of this but i've not taken a close look at it until now and it's interesting and i was thinking the whole time you're talking well how is this a solo game with two to four players and then you just described it and it sounds like it was perhaps a miss on their part or maybe they're intending to do a uh, expansion that'll play on that more with upgraded components i don't know but it's, it looks pretty neat you know actually the first thing i thought of was brass birmingham mm -hmm. or brass yeah. uh, lancashire Lan lancashire is that lancashire, the other one yeah. lancashire yeah. um have you played it's either the same of the those? same milieu the kind of age of steam right yeah captains of industry type thing yeah I, I'm surprised I haven't bought Brass Birmingham yet because I watched Shut Up and Sit Down's video on it and it just blew me away how cool it looked like. And it's like, yeah, this is kind of appealing to me, this whole engine building, old school, old timey, turn of the century 
captains of industry kind of a thing is kind of neat. So yeah. Oh, great. That's what I need is another item on my list. Lovely. Oh, well, that's what we're here for. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> it's super light and it's super fast playing and it's so, so easy to get to the table. And that's cool. kind of like what I'm figuring out lately is, you know, cause you know, I'm struggling with the heavier games. Our work life is getting pretty, you know, um, demanding shall we say so i don't have a lot of mental bandwidth for learning big complex games um but i can get these these quick easy to learn ones to the table and still feel a you know gaming satisfactions still uh, feed that that desire so that's kind of cool that's um for good I'll, I'll i'll mention this one super quick i've also been very active recently on the print and play front so i mentioned gabe barrett earlier in connection with the hunted series of games so he's got a new kickstarter out uh, called the Realm of Shadows, which is a trilogy of light fantasy themed card games. Um, it is on Kickstarter right now with like 25 days to go uh, as we're recording this. Um, so Gabe designed two of the three games, The Forgotten Road and The Last Stronghold. And then um, he took a game designed by Joe Klipfell, who's an indie designer. Um, and he Joe had designed a game for like the last solo um print and play design contest on BGG on board game geek called that. He called it grip hold tower. And his, um, his inspiration was Palm Island. If you're familiar with that game where you play, it's basically like a, a civilization builder that you play in the palm of one hand. Um, hmm. If you've heard of that one and it's, it's a surprisingly deep game designed by John Meatling, Meitling. Anyway, Joe took inspiration from that, and he also took inspiration from the Rock Manor Studios game um, Set a Watch, which is kind of like a tower defense game where you're fighting wave after wave of enemies. And he designed a game that fits, that plays in two hands, um, where you have the monsters, you have a hero, you've got abilities, you've got uh, stats. And it's all happening just in your hands. That's the uh, it's and uh, so Gabe Gabe signed the game Grip Hold Tower and Joe and he's publishing it under the name Hand of Destiny, which is also kind of a cool game, right? It's play on words there, the Hand of Destiny. Um, <laughs> and so nice. I uh, Gabe contacted me before the Kickstarter launch, and he's like, "Hey Martin, I'm sending you the print and play files of all these three games. If you could." build these and then shoot previews of them. I can link them on my Kickstarter. So I, I've done that for a couple of his other campaigns before. And so anyway, long story short, I played Hand of Destiny. It's it's <laughs> it, it pretty much achieves most of the objectives that Joe, you know, set out to do. Make a handheld kind of dungeon crawl game, micro game like you can play. Um, the rules need a little bit of um, love. And I told that to Gabe. I'm like, the, the rules are kind of hard to understand. And, and Gabe was like, he's a great game designer. He's He needs help with writing the rules. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, Gabe is going to re revise the rules that's down the road to his very clean and clear style. Um, I've also played The Forgotten Road, which is essentially very, very abstracted, simple um, kind of dungeon crawl. You've got uh, a road. You, basically, every card is uh, uh, the next part of your adventure. And you move to a new location, you fight a monster there, and then you mo keep moving on. You So you play six road cards, and then you get to a road boss. And if you manage to beat the road boss, then you descend to the dungeon cards. There's six dungeon cards, and then there's a dungeon boss. That's, that's the length of the game. And all the while, your main engines for um, satisfying the requirements for moving and fighting are these cards in your hand that have move values and fight values. And you've also got these uh, four, uh, these three dice that help you resolve skill checks by every time you need to do us to move to a new card, there's like a skill check requirement. You have to roll these values and then you roll the dice. And then if you can't, you have to sacrifice cards to, to make up the difference. So it's all very light. It's all very straightforward, but it's also very, very, you know, pretty cool. Um, and then there's one more game called the last stronghold, which is kind of like a tower defense game, but I haven't played that one yet. Sadly, I didn't get to play it in time for the Kickstarter campaign, but realm of shadows trilogy of light fantasy themed card games. Um, they're a good time. And the campaign is already on its way to being like three X or four X funded on the Kickstarter. So they're, you know, it's, wow. it's successful. <laughs> it is very successful. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, so I'll just, I'll just finish out my list of stuff here. Um, <laughs> sure, go ahead. 
Uh, again, con continuing my theme of light games, I played a game called Little Town designed by Shun and Aya Taguchi. So it's originally a Japanese design game published by Aiello uh, in English. Aiello is a Europe-based uh, publisher, I believe. So this is a very light worker placement and tile placement game. The art style is Cute Medieval Village. Um, and again, as, just like Furnace, which is almost like a pure stripped down engine builder this is a very pure stripped down city building worker placement game basically um there's a market of cards and then there's a map uh, a grid map and then basically uh or tiles rather not cards and so um you can um spend resources to purchase tiles. And then when you place tiles in the, uh, you're building a little town, right? As the name implies. And then as you place them, um, you activate all of the spaces around that tile that you placed. Oh, I'm sorry. You place a worker and then you activate all of the eight spaces around that tile, even diagonal. And then you just gain the benefit of whatever is printed there. So if there's a tree there, then you gain wood. If there's a, a lake there or a stream, then you get um, fish. If there's a stone there, then you get stone or, you know, so um, it, it, it's all very, very straightforward, but it gets you because you're placing tiles and they can be in different positions on the map. It, it, it very quickly gets you into these like, you know, interesting kind of, strategic and tactical decision points. Now, again, this was a two to four player game that did not have a solo mode in the box. So what did I do? I designed my own card driven solo AI opponent deck of 12 cards that I decided to call Auto Metro, which I mean, I thought it was a cover, you know, because of Metro, even though it's a city, metro, you know, metropol Metropolis, and it's an auto Automa Metro. What? No, nobody appreciates it. Nobody appreciates no, Never mind. <laughs> so, Michael, are you there? Oh, I was on, I'm on mute. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a good one. Bravo. Sorry, I was saying bravo, sir, bravo. And you're like, are you there? Oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I, I just took the inspiration. It's like it's a 12-card AI deck that basically allows you to resolve your your AI opponent. Where are they going to place or what are they going to do? Are they going to buy a card from the market or are they going to place a worker on their turn? And um, I didn't play test it at all, but it seems to work really well. You know, I didn't play test it before I, before I designed it and made the rules for it, but um, it seems to work really well. I mean, I've been having fun playing against it, and it's posted on BGG and... 11 people like it so far. So. <laughs> yeah, I so, just hey. looked that up. That looks cool. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. So the la And then the other thing that I've been doing, aside from playing light games and making an Atoma for one of them, is uh, I've been, I do a bunch of rethemes. So uh, there's a game called Fantasy Realms, which was made, I think, in 2017, I want to say. No, no, no. Fantasy Realms has been around a long time. Uh, super quick. Let's see how, when was Fantasy Realms published? 20, oh yeah, 2017. Okay. Um, but it's like a generic kind of, you know, fantasy theme. And I thought, why don't I retheme this to one of my favorite, um, comic book series, <laughs> graphic novels of all time. So I rethemed it to Watchmen. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very pleased with that. I also made a couple of, um, play mat custom play mats for for uh, for this one featuring Dr. Manhattan another featuring Rorschach. So anyway, and and there's cool. there's fan-made rules on how to play Fantasy Realms solo. It's 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 a card game where you find synergies between between cards. It's a good time. Um, and then the other thing is there is a game called Regicide uh, designed by uh, Badgers from Mars. It's a New Zealand outfit of game designers, very very cool people, very nice. And um, it's basically a game that you can play with a standard deck of cards and they came up with a rule set for it. It's a cooperative um, kind of you're all fighting against the big bad boss kind of or big deck of big bad bosses kind of game. It's it's basically like a um, a very tiny version of Aeon's End, <laughs> if you will. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and and it and it's cool. And it's it's a lot of people have hailed it as. Uh, a brilliant game design, pretty much the best game that you can play with a standard deck of cards. And I was very interested in this, but 
I I don't generally uh, get excited by playing with a standard deck of cards, so I rethemed it to another one of my th- favorite themes, which is Twin Peaks. Um, nice. So that's also on Board Game Geek, and uh, we'll we'll put a link to that in the show notes. But yeah, um, that's pretty much everything that I, that that brings you up to speed, Michael, on everything that I've been doing <laughs> since the last time we recorded an episode. It's not much. It's not no, much, and I, you know, when you, when, this... when you say that you you've got a problem and you need an intervention and you're obsessed with board games, I I, I don't know what you mean. I, I don't share <laughs> similar <laughs> similar obsessions. <laughs> I was gonna say, come on, Martin, you got to do something for the community, man. I mean, geez, what's the deal? <laughs> Hardly anything at all. I'm just kidding, of course. You, geez, I mean, yeah. that's awesome. That's that's amazing. How much I'm you get just done. The, I'm the kind of person who can't leave well enough alone when I see. A game that I want to try. I'd never played Fantasy Realms, but I'm like, I'm not going to play it with this generic fantasy theme. But if I make this Watchmen, I'll totally play it. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, pretty much the same thing with... uh, Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention. I'm also about 30% done uh, with a massive, massive retheme of a deck building game from 2016 called Tyrants of the Underdark. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, It's a combo of deck building and kind of area control, which has been pretty widely hailed. But again, um, the knocks on the game is it's a kind of generic fantasy theme. It's the drow, if you're familiar with D&D, the, the yep. drow elves. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and it's a very, very dark color palette. And and a lot of the art is uneven. These these are some of the, uh, these are some of the, the criticisms against the game. And I'm like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if it was like something cooler and nicer, to, you know, like a theme that I... So I'm, anyway, I'm, re- I'm re-theming it to The Expanse, the TV show, which is great, but th- this is also a, a much, much, much larger game than either Fantasy Realms or Regicide. So uh, I think there's like 250 cards in the game plus uh, 15 or 16 hex maps, and I don't know what. So oh, I don't know what I got myself into, but that's Dude. that's a long-term project. <laughs> I'm looking at your thread right now. Holy crap, dude. I mean, I <laughs> I love The Expanse. I love The Expanse. I just recently binged watched it earlier this summer. I had stayed away from it for whatever reason. And then I'm like, why did I miss out on this? This is awesome. It's and I'm so looking great. at this now. Man, that's a lot of work. But that is so good looking. I like that. I have never yeah. played Tyrants of the Underdark, so I don't have a point of reference. But that's that's a passion project there for sure. That looks really good. Yeah. Uh, oh, and I like it's the only way I'm going to play Tyrants of the Underdark. So I'm really doing this. <laughs> self, it's self-serving reasons. <laughs> I like I like your geek list name too. Martin has fallen down the retheme rabbit hole. Yeah, they're all they're all like that. They're, Martin has fallen down the print and play rabbit hole, the thrifty <laughs> rabbit hole, the, the, the retheme. Yeah, soon Very it'll cool. be like Martin has fallen down the uh, the intervention rabbit hole. Oh, uh, well, we all have our rabbit holes to fall down into, and I'm sure everybody understands. That's cool. That's very good. I like that. Awesome. Thank you, sir. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to our ramblings about nothing in particular, Seinfeld style. Uh, this <laughs> wraps up episode 85 of the Solosaurus podcast. We are proud to be part of the Dice Tower Network. And for even more Solosaurus, please join our post-show discussions and other shenanigans on Facebook at facebook.com slash Solosaurus. Follow us on Instagram at Solosaurus podcast or shoot us an email at Solosaurus podcast at gmail.com. And as you might imagine, we are on Board Game Geek, and the quickest way to find us is just go to your favorite search engine and type in Solosaurus BGG, and you will find our home on Board Game Geek. We're also on YouTube if you prefer to listen to podcasts on a video streaming site. Um, there's no there's no video of us talking. It's just the audio of the show. Right. But it's on YouTube if you want to get it there. Um, <laughs> and if you want your very own Solosaurus micro badge, just hit me up on Board Game Geek. My handle is Dr. Henry Armitage. That's at Dr. Henry Armitage. And I will spot you the geek gold for your very own Solosaurus micro badge. And thanks again to Stone Valley Games for being our sponsor. As always, if there's any particular games you'd like us to take a look at, don't hesitate to send us an email or drop us a message on social media. As always, I'm Michael Eckenfels. And I'm the nothing in particular version of Martin Gonzalez. And thank you for listening. Bye, y'all. Bye.